Hi, I'm Stephanie Valinsky, Deputy Director of the Illinois Supreme Court Commission on Professionalism. Welcome to Reimagining Law. We're exploring how legal professionals are adapting the delivery of legal services to meet the needs of today's consumers. I'm joined by Alan Mills, Executive Director of Uptown People's Law Center. Alan, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. The Uptown People's Law Center does prisoners' rights work. In particular, some of your work has focused on the medical care of those who are incarcerated. Prior to COVID-19, what types of medical issues were you focusing on? So for the last 10 years, we had been uh, litigating or investigating uh, two different what turned into class action cases, one about mental health care and one about medical care in, throughout the Illinois Department of Corrections. Both are statewide cases. Um, about four years ago, we entered into a consent decree or a settlement agreement in the mental health one. And about a year ago, we entered into a consent decree on the medical care one. Um, what we had found was that the medical care in Illinois provided to its prisoners was abysmal. Um, when we started this, uh, these cases, uh, Illinois ranked at about 48th among the 50 states as to how much money we spent per prisoner. Uh, we've improved that a little bit. So we're now more up about 40 than of the 50, but we're still way down at the bottom of the pile. And it's not just by a little bit. Uh, Illinois spent about a fifth of what California spends per prisoner. Granted, California is a more expensive state, but not five times more expensive than we are. And as you may remember, California is a state where the, the United States Supreme Court held a number of years ago that the medical care there was so bad that the only solution was to let people go home. Um, so you can imagine how bad Illinois' medical and mental health care were. Uh, even today, the ratio of staff, medical staff to prisoners in Illinois is way down at the bottom of the stack of all the states. Last that I saw, we were number 49 of 50 states. Mm -hmm. So we have a long ways to go, um, particularly in the medical care case in our, in our settlement agreement. It was envisioned to be a 10-year process in order to hire uh, more staff, more qualified staff, put into place the kind of systems you need to actually provide medical care. The most obvious example is Illinois is still a paper-based system. Um, almost every other corrections and certainly doctors have gone to electronic medical records, not Illinois. So we have a very long way to go. And how has your work changed since COVID-19? Obviously, nature did not give us 10 years to fix the system. Uh, less than a year later, we had a crisis. Uh, and we have seen the results of that at Stateville Correctional Center, um, which is the hardest hit of all of our prisons. Whereas of today, we have 122 prisoners and uh, 75 staff who have tested positive for COVID-19 in that prison. We have 10 prisoners who have died, one of the highest rates of death in the entire uh, country, uh, 50 out of every 1,000 people have, uh, sorry, 20 out of every thousand uh, people have died. Um, my math is bad. Let me start that over again. <laughs> of the 2,000 prisoners, 10 have died. That's among the highest rates anywhere in the country. Um, people are talking more like 20, prison, 20 people out of 100,000 in places like New York as being a horrible number. We've got 10 out of 2,000 dying at Stateville. So um, you can imagine that that means the medical care there was not anywhere near what it needed to be to deal with this kind of crisis. The failures of the existing medical system became quite clear when the governor had to mobilize the Illinois National Guard not to provide security at Stateville Correctional Center, but to provide medical care. Uh, so we now have a, a dozen or so medics uh, and support personnel from the National Guard supplementing the totally inadequate medical care at Stateville. Uh, and in fact, now we're talking, we saw yesterday the governor talking about using the National Guard at other prisons, Sheridan Correctional Center and Hill Correctional Center, both now have a number of positive tests by prisoners, uh, and they also may well need some help. So three prisoner rights cases were filed on April 2nd, uh, seeking uh, release of certain prisoners due to the spread of COVID-19. So it's now the end of April. Uh, what's happened with these cases? So none of them uh, succeeded in getting any immediate relief through the court system. Um, the three cases, uh, one was a traditional Section 1983 civil rights case filed in the federal court here in Chicago, um, claiming that keeping people 
who were particularly vulnerable to COVID-19, locked in prisons where they could not be kept safe, was a violation of the Eighth Amendment. Uh, one was a, a group habeas corpus claim, making the exact same argument, but in a habeas cor under a habeas corpus um, uh, framework. And then the third was a direct action for mandamus to the Illinois Supreme Court, again, asking them to do the same thing. All three asked to um, order the governor and the Illinois Department of Corrections to speed up the use of mechanisms the legislature had long ago established to allow the release of people who were particularly vulnerable um, from a prison setting uh, in, in the ordinary course, but we said in an emergency they should be using them even more than usual. Um, in all, the Illinois Supreme Court just dismissed the mandamus without any uh, opinion at all. Um, in the judge then consolidated the habeas and Section 1983 cases, uh, issuing an opinion saying that he was denying any emergency relief, partly on procedural grounds and partly because he wanted to see how the department was going to do in terms of actually using the mechanisms. Remember, we filed this fairly early on. Um, in the in the process, we're now almost uh, three weeks later. Um, if my math is right, uh, <laughs> I'm losing track of time, being sequestered this whole time. Right. Uh, but roughly three weeks later, um, and what we saw was, in fact, that some action was taken. Uh, the most obvious example is the governor has started issuing some clemencies. Um, the Department of Corrections has begun to give back some good time to people so they can be taken out. Um, all of the women who were um, who had children in the children program at Decatur and most of the women who were pregnant have been released on medical furloughs or otherwise gotten out of the prison system. Um, so some action has been taken. Um, currently, we are discussing with the Department of Corrections other means that we can work together to try to increase the numbers that get out. So those are ongoing discussions. Okay. And what do you say to people who believe releasing prisoners will do more harm um, than the spread of the virus within the Illinois prisons? Well, I, I say two things. First of all, they're wrong, uh, that there's no evidence that the people being let out pose any danger to anyone. Um, people, people are spending very long times in prison. Some of the people who've been let out are quite old, uh, disabled, uh, obviously not a threat to anybody. Uh, others were convicted of quite low-level felonies, uh, simple possession of drugs, and again, don't pose any danger to anyone. If anything, the Department of Corrections and the governor's office have been far too conservative in who they let out rather than letting people out without any reviews at all. We think there are a lot more people that could be let out. Uh, the second, though, is that people forget how many people go in and out of our prisons on a weekly basis regardless. In addition to the prisoners, there are about 7,000 staff members. So on a, on a weekly basis, some 7,000 people walk in and out the doors of a prison. Mm -hmm. We also let out about 300 people a week because their sentences are over, having nothing to do with COVID-19. So the real question we should be asking is, do we want those people to walk out of the prison with or without an infection, with, and with, with or without being contagious? If you want them to walk out and come back to their communities before they become contagious, you have to let them out sooner rather than later. So that's our basic argument here is if you want to solve this pandemic on the outside, you have to solve it on the inside. And it's impossible to do when our prisons are stuffed full of people who have no way of maintaining social distancing, who have no way of, of ensuring there's not going to be cross-contamination. Once one guard has it, it's going to spread throughout the prison. And we've seen that at Stateville. There was just a recent article in the Chicago Tribune that mentioned bond funds bailing people out who then went on to commit additional crimes. Can you discuss how this overlaps with the work you are doing? I, I think it's, it's somewhat different. Um, the, the problem with the Tribune article is, first of all, it, it looked at a very small sample. Uh, and second of all, it, it included uh, people who committed new crimes, a wide variety of things that aren't most people wouldn't consider crimes at all, um, or it was things that happened long after they were bailed out, and therefore there was no way for anybody to know about it. But the most important thing is, it's not the bond funds who make the decisions as to who is dangerous and who isn't. Everybody that was let out by the Chicago Bond Fund had already been determined by a judge that they weren't too dangerous to allow into the community. The only reason they were in prison is because they were poor. 
And that's the only thing that the bond fund did is get rid of poverty as a reason why people should stay inside. No, nobody obviously could be bonded out unless the judge had already set a bond saying, if you have money, you can go home. And therefore they had decided they weren't too dangerous. Anybody who was too dangerous to let out, judges just had a simple solution. Don't set a bond at all. And there are a lot of people in Cook County Jail who don't have bonds. But for everybody else, they're only there because they're poor. And at this point, I mean, I talked about Stateville before, but Cook County Jail is far worse off in terms of the spread of COVID-19. At this point, leaving people in Cook County Jail is facing them with an, a, a, a very strong chance of dying or certainly becoming gravely ill. And to subject someone to that level of risk merely because they are poor makes no sense whatsoever. That is not the way this society is supposed to work. So I've been involved with the Chicago Community Bond Fund since it was founded as a member of his advisory board. I fully support what they've done and think they're doing a great job getting people out. Uh, we should not be have a dual track uh, criminal justice system where rich people get one system and poor people get another. And that's what they're fighting. So going forward, do you, do you feel like the pandemic will change how medical care is provided to prisoners? I hope so. Um, I hope that this has driven home to the Department of Corrections just how dangerous the failings of the system are and that it's absolutely imperative to fix them as quickly as possible. Um, unfortunately, there's, we've gotten a lot of pushback from that uh, and they've often taken the position that in fact they have to slow down fixing the system while they deal with the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, our position is that the governor has issued a number of executive orders which remove many of the bureaucratic steps that need to be taken in order to hire people. The department should be taking advantage of that and hiring as many doctors, nurses, uh, emergency medical technicians, and everybody else that's needed to make this system work um, as possible, as quickly as possible, in order to contain this crisis. And then those folks will continue to work and can provide medical care as we go forward. So I'm hoping that it improves the system quickly because we have uh, demonstrated how bad it is, but I'm concerned that it will slow things down and make it a longer process to fix rather than a shorter process. How is what is happening in the prison system impacting the public health system? The other, the other issue that people don't uh, often think about is the impact that what happens inside prison will have on the public health care system in general outside of prison. We saw that at Joliet, uh, where once people became very ill at Stateville, they were transferred to emergency rooms and ultimately uh, intensive care units in Joliet, the, the town, and that quickly filled all of the available beds, meaning that people from the community had no access to health care at all. Joliet, in a sense, Stateville is the great test case because Joliet and the, is near Chicago and has a lot more medical infrastructure than do a lot of the rural prisons downstate. My big fear is Menard Correctional Center located in Randolph County in the far southern Illinois. Um, if Menard Correctional Center has 2,000 prisoners, um, should the virus spread throughout that prison and spill over into the community for care, the entire county only has two ICU beds. The entire southern uh, 18 counties in, in um, Illinois only have I made notes, uh, only have 72 ha intensive care unit beds. So you can imagine all 18 counties quickly filling up the ICU beds should Menard spread like it did at Stateville. That would be disastrous for the entire southern region of Illinois. So I think it's in everybody's interest to view this very much as a public health problem, not as a prison problem. Okay, thank you so much for joining me, Alan. And um, for everyone watching, please go ahead and like and share this video and subscribe to our channel to stay updated on new episodes, information on how to stay connected both to the commission and the Uptown People's Law Center is in the notes. Uh, thank you so much for watching.